Hello, my name is BJ Harris. Welcome to Tapping Into His Treasures. How is everybody today? Set up here. Um, it's just a bright, wonderful October morning. And um, last night there was an eclipse. I didn't see it really well, but I did get to see a little of it. Let me just tell you what happened. You know how I'm always talking about God's impeccable timing? Well, last night I uh, watched a uh, a Christian movie on YouTube, and it was over at 10 minutes to 8. So, from the movie channel, I went to uh, fa uh, Facebook just to check the news feed, and my granddaughter-in-law, Barbara, in Connecticut, wrote a post that read, in 10 minutes at 7.50 p.m. Eastern Time on the East Coast, like, go outside and check out the, the eclipse. And I looked at the clock and it was exactly 7.50. So the timing was right on. So I did go outside and I did see a little bit on the, like, the lower right-hand uh, part of the moon. And it was a harvest moon to begin with, so it was just beautiful. And I did catch it. So impeccable timing. Absolutely impeccable. If the movie was over, like, a half an hour later, I would have missed it. And if it was over way before, I don't know. It just probably would not have happened. So, um, praise God for that. Our subject today is loyalty. How many times have you, like on purpose, just to, just stop to think about loyalty and what, what it means to you? I will tell you the truth. I have, but not really to a great degree throughout my life. And... Uh, Recently, I have. So yesterday, I was on the, um, the net in YouTube looking for some loyalty stories. And I came up with one, and this is going to tie in with the Bible, of course. I came up with one uh, about Charlie Two Shoes, and uh, I'm just going to touch on it. Because I have to be careful when things are copyrighted. But this one came across on the news and everything. Uh, long before 2013, but anyway, good stories live on. So, it was about this, uh, I think it was in China, when our military was in China, and they kind of adopted this uh, young uh, Chinese boy, he was probably preteen at the time, and he had a name that was very difficult to pronounce for our servicemen. So they gave him the nickname of Charlie Two Shoes, and uh, he became their mascot. But then, after the war, the servicemen had to come home to the states, and they kept in touch with him. And uh, uh, because he was a friend to the Marines, he actually was put in jail for not renouncing his friendship with them. But here is the story of true loyalty. All that he had to do, I mean, the servicemen were across the ocean back home. They would never have known had he done it. But God would have known. He was so devoted to them because they gave him food. Um, they were just like his adoptive parents, all of them, one in particular. And um, nobody would have known the difference if he renounced them to the Chinese government. And uh, he wouldn't, so he spent a fair amount of time in jail because of it. So after many years went by, uh, they were in touch. The, the, his adoptive father and Charlie Two Shoes were in touch. And then several from the company and Charlie got together, uh, uh, and they went back to China to the same area where they met and had all that wonderful fellowship together because Charlie did say at the end of the show that he was a Christian. And so anyway, what does that mean to you to, to hear a story like that, an inspiring story like that about loyalty? It makes you want to wish you could have that same loyalty, you know? So, and then uh, I was reading um, something else about loyalty, about another story pertaining to uh, the church and a pastor from a long, long time ago. And uh, this one really grabbed me because you don't hear these intense stories so much anymore. Uh, it was about 
a pastor of a large, large church <coughs> in America. Excuse me. Let me take a little slug here. And even have my coffee this morning, I had wanted to hurry up and do this while the sun was still coming in the window. So anyway, he, he pastored a large, large church. And uh, he had a board, uh, elders and all that, you know, financial directors and whatnot. So anyway, their budget uh, was showing uh, about a half a million dollar loss because they had taken on uh, a program, and uh, it was a great program, but it was costing them money. And there were about six of them that uh, made up their minds they weren't you, they weren't going to bend. And the pastor was against all of them. I mean, there was no arguing and all that, but he just, you know, he, the pastor's the one who has the anointing of the spirit supposedly, and. He felt from God that it was not the right way to go because the people who had pledged that money for that uh, ministry uh, did so in good faith and it would really be stabbing them, really, in the back, so to speak, if they discontinued the program. And there was just a, there was a variety of reasons why it just did not seem moral to let the program go and to disappoint so many people. So anyway, um, they kept praying about it and have meeting, having meeting after meeting, and uh, finally they couldn't agree. So the pastor, uh, he didn't change his position, but what he said to them was, um, "Do it your way. You are unanimous in how you feel about it, and uh, I will never ever say to you if this thing." doesn't go the way you're hoping it to. I will never say to you, I told you so. I will be one with you publicly in front of the whole congregation and publicly. I will never express my thoughts and my views to anybody. And uh, that's exactly what happened. And what he's supposed to happen, everybody came against him, him being the pastor. Uh, they called him a two-faced hypocrite and everything under the sun. And... Um, what eventually happened was all the people who had pledged for that particular ministry, big donors, uh, left the church. And ultimately, it ended up costing the church a million dollars to have all those people go, people who were supporting the church financially. And uh, so they lost way more by losing the people, by not following the pastor's gut feeling, than they were losing by supporting the ministry. And the pastor never breathed a word. Now, what does that say to you? It says to me that loyalty is much more intense than I ever imagined. And uh, man just deserves our respect. Anybody who's like him in this world today, you don't hear stories about things like this. They're always on the back page of the newspaper. You never see it on the front page of the first ten pages. So it must be going on, we just don't hear about it. So, and then uh, relating to the scriptures, um, the story, the, the first story that came to mind was the story of Saul and David. And you remember in 1 Samuel 26, starting at um, verse 6, uh, I'll, I'll read it to you instead of just giving you my words. Then David said to Ahimelech the Hittite, and to Joab's brother Abishai, the son of Zeru, here we go, I'm lost already, the son of Zeru, Aye, who will go down, who will go down with me into the camp up to Saul. Remember, Saul with his army, some of his men uh, were at camp, and David was in the vicinity. So David and Abishai went to the army by night. And there they saw sleeping. Do you remember the story? They sleeping with his encampment, with his spear stuck in the ground at his head. And Abner and the armies lay around him. Then said Abishai to David, God has given your enemy into your hand this day. Follow it now. Abishai is with David. And he said to David these words, 
God has given your enemy into your hand this day. Now please let me pin him to the earth with one stroke of the spear, and I will not strike him twice. But David said to Abishai, Do not destroy him, for who can put out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? And David said, As the Lord lives, the Lord will strike him, or his day will come to die, or he will go down into the battle and perish. So that was another case of intense loyalty. Who was he being loyal to? He was being loyal to God, because God's the one that said, Do not strike your hand against my anointed. Saul may have been doing terrible things and acting foolishly, but he was still the Lord's anointed as king. And David refused, even though he was right there for the killing, David refused to strike him down or to have Abishai strike him down. So that was loyalty. And he was also being loyal to Saul, but ultimately he was being loyal to God. I want to be loyal to God that way every day of my life. God help me, help all of us to be loyal in that same fashion. And then the second uh, story that came to my mind, uh, uh, Bible story concerning loyalty, was David and Jonathan, Jonathan, Saul's son. Remember the story how they loved each other, they were knit in their souls, and that's found in 1 Samuel 18. I'm going to read it verbatim. As soon as he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his, as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David. Oh, my word. You really have to love somebody and trust somebody and admire somebody to take off your robe and to give it to the, your soul. Uh, who you're knit with in your soul. In his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. And David went out and was successful wherever Saul sent him. So that Saul sent him, set him over the men of war. So he was gaining position in the eyes of Saul. And you remember what that did. It brought on extreme jealousy. And this was good in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul servants. So, yep, that's when he was out to kill him because he couldn't stand it. Remember, the rest of the story goes that um, the ladies would sing, Saul killed his thousand or something like that, but David killed his tens of thousands. So that admiration didn't last very long. So back to loyalty. Many do not put much value on the subject of loyalty. Many take it lightly. To many it means a great deal. If you ask ten different people what loyalty is, you will get ten different answers. I am not led to go into the different definitions of loyalty according to the dictionary today. Sometimes I do. But I will tell you what it is not, however. When one family comes against another family and family members will hurt anyone who comes against their family, like with the feud between the Hatfields and the McCoys a long, long time ago, that is not loyalty to the family. They are defending the honor of their family. That's pride. If a person is in a gang, let's say, and protects the, le the gang leader in battle, that is not true loyalty. In God's eyes, what again, it's pride, and also they want to save their skin, too. Uh, there's always self-motivation in a lot of these uh, seemingly loyal acts. You really have to assess them. In God's eyes, what loyalty is all about has to do with the condition of the heart, and it is very important to him. Many would tell you that they are loyal people, but they would tell you that off the top of their head, or off the top of their hat, however the saying goes, not really realizing what they are saying. Through the years, I've observed that many people, even pastors, had at one time amazing loyalty to a ministry 
and to the head pastor, yet when the congregations came against them for their loyalty to that person, these are pastors with smaller churches and, and the big organism, when their congregations came against them for their loyalty to that person, they could not take the persecution or the pressure so they renounce their loyalty to the ministry and to God's chosen instrument. I'm speaking to Simeon today, who taught them most everything that they knew. They didn't intentionally set out to turn against the person they had been loyal to. They just lacked the strength and or the integrity to stand firm. Hence, loyalty in those cases was put to the test and proved not to be loyalty at all, not true loyalty. You may have had a seemingly loyal friend. These are just scenarios. You may, and it's commentary. I'm not saying, that, you know, my calling isn't to just preach strictly the Word of God. That's not my calling. I don't have the gift of teaching, so I, it's, I vacillate from uh, Word of God, uh, spirituality, all God, to commentary. So please understand that. You may have some, you may have had a seemingly loyal friend for 50 years, but maybe you've never had differences or a serious problem between you. Here's, here's, um, here's the case scenario. Let's say two 70-year-old men have been friends for 50 years. Really good friends. They were like brothers. I won't go so far as to say they've been chunks, but they were as close as you can get, okay? Maybe they were drinking buddies. And then after the 50 years, one of them loses his wife. Then let's say that the other wife tries her best to console the widower. You know, this happens. I've seen it happen anyway. And she cooks for him and has him in their home to help him with his loneliness. So let's say the one who lost the wife takes light into her and he's soaking all the attention. He's soaking up all the attention. So what do you suppose could happen? The loyalty between the two men will be tested. And you see that happening? And you're going to find that when loyalty is tested like that, you're going to find that it's not true loyalty at all. And there were hundreds of scenarios. Hundreds. Loyalty must be put to the test in order to be true loyalty. On a personal note, I have been known to say that I am a diehard when it comes to being loyal to my church. But the truth is that my loyalty lies with God. I'm just speaking for myself here. God the Holy Spirit is where my true loyalties lie. Not with a church and not with the people of a church. Um, many years ago, I think it's going on 42 years now, when God called me to the ministry that I'm in, uh, I lived in Mid Coast, Maine. Um, in, I'm trying to think. We only lived there for nine months, so I was trying to think of the name of the town. But anyway, in an old farmhouse, all by itself, it was like a mile and a half uh, away from the closest house. And I was going, oh, I had a picture window in my di dining room. And when I looked out the picture window, in the distance I could see the steeple to uh, the church that I had just uh, visited for the first time, was a member or anything. And it was kind of a nice scene to see a church steeple out the window. It was a beautiful view. So then one night, when I had to get up in the night to go into the kitchen, I won't get into the whole story of it, but when I went, it was pitch black pitch black at the Ace of Spades. I happened to just look out the window as I went by because it was my, I wasn't thinking, it was my normal thing every time I passed the window to look outside at my view. So here I go through the dining room into the kitchen and I look out and what do I see but a massive fiery blaze over the church steeple. And it was amazing, amazing. I didn't know what it was all about but it was amazing. And I really wanted to behold the vision. It was a vision. And uh, 
but my mentality at that time was if I run to the kitchen to get the baby's pacifier, because he's the one that was screaming, take it back and put it in his mouth and quiet him down. Then I'll go back to the dining room window, and I will just take all the time that I need to behold the vision. And um, so I went to the kitchen for the pacifier. I came back. I looked. But this time I'm looking to the left, looking at the vision. Beautiful. I run to the bedroom, put the pacifier in the baby's mouth. I come back, and the vision's gone. Well, I couldn't even get to sleep after that. I knew whatever I saw was supernatural. And I felt it was very, very beautiful. I felt that it was from God. So I also felt that God was telling me to stay with this church. It was a Holy Spirit ministry. Where in my mind, I wasn't sure that it was going to be a fit for me. And I was still going to I was searching churches. I was going to different ones. I was going to pick off the one that I felt would be the best fit. And uh, so I felt that God was telling me to stay with this church. But then the next day, as happens, you know, the devil will come in and try to counterfeit what God has given you. So the next day, the devil came in and um, um, tried to tell me that it was a bad thing. So then I was really confused. So then somebody told me that I should go to the church and talk to the pastor. Well, I ended up talking with the assistant pastor, and he's the one that said to me, any time you see a blaze or fire in conjunction with the church, it's the Holy Spirit. So from that very moment on, 42 years ago, um, my loyalty has been not to the church, not to the pastor, not to the congregation, but to the Holy Spirit himself who formed this organism um, body of Christ, and uh, that's where my loyalties lie. So just to get that straight. Oh, so yeah, I said all that to say that uh, even after my head pastor went home to be with the Lord some years ago, uh, the church body strayed in all kinds of different directions because they felt that they no longer had any obligations to the pastor, or the, obviously, to the pastor or to the ministry. Um, and God bless them, God bless them, but I never saw it as the pastor's ministry. I've always seen it as God's ministry. So even though it's years past that now, my heart is devoted to the ministry that God founded. And uh, I'm a diehard, I'm not going anyplace. Whoops, excuse me. Oh, yes, here we go. I'm not saying that I haven't been tempted because of uh, human traits and characters, you know, rubbing each other the wrong way and iron sharpens iron. I'm not saying I haven't been tempted, but uh, I would never, ultimately, I would never leave. Oh, you ought to go to the uh, Internet for some loyalty stories. Uh, it's just loaded with them. Just loaded with them. I don't even know if I have time to read this. All right, let me tell you this one really, really quickly. That's not exactly loyalty, but it's kind of on the same type of uh, thought about the elderly carpenter who was ready to retire, and he told his employer slash contractor of his plans. This is the author is unknown, so I'm okay to share this. He told the employer contractor of his plans to leave the house building business and live a more leisurely life with his wife and enjoying his extended family. He would miss the paycheck, but he needed to retire. They could get by. And then the contractor was sorry to see this good worker go and asked if he would build just one more house as a personal favor. The carpenter said yes, but in time it was easy to see that his heart was not in it in his work. He resorted to shoddy workmanship and used inferior materials. It was an unfortunate way to end his career. When the carpenter finished his work and the builder came to inspect the house, the contractor handed the front door key to the carpenter. This is your house, he said, my gift to you. So do you get the point of the story? Now this isn't exactly a loyalty story, I'll say that again, but the carpenter did not display integrity to the builder, to himself or to God, and as a result, it had an effect on him. And 
that boils it down. And now here's where the loyalty does come in. When we are loyal, not only are we pleasing to man, but we are pleasing to God. We may never be recognized for our loyalty to man, but God never forgets our loyalty. And in his time, in one way or another, we will be rewarded for our loyalty. So that's why, uh, let's use an analogy of uh, our loyalty to people as this house that the carpenter built. You know, let's put, let's give it all. Let's just not be a surface loyalty person and just use it as a, just a word that flies off of our tongue without any meaning behind it. Let's really put true loyalty into our friendships, especially when it comes to church and our pastors. So thanks for watching. God bless you and God bless yours. God keep you and God keep yours. Till next time, bye-bye for now.